Welcome to our July HASP monthly program. Recently, I reread parts of Kim's 25th anniversary detailed history of HASP published in 2013. Two things might be of interest to you. One was the existence of associate members. When the organization first started in 1988, Spouses of members could participate in the classes and programs of the academy. They were considered associate members because they did not have full responsibilities and voting privileges of active members, nor did they pay dues. By June of 1995, HASP had grown to 249 members and 137 associate members. I didn't think this was going to be funny, but <laughs> anyway, a year later, both the membership committee and the organization were struggling with the role of associate members. In January 1997, the membership committee and the board recommended associate status be officially deleted. At the annual meeting that year in June, associates were given until August 1st to become members without full application, but they had to pay membership dues. Between 1996 and 1998, the membership grew from 275 to nearly 400. It appears that most of the increase represented associate members who had decided to become full members in 1997. The second thing I found interesting was the change in gender balance. In 1996, eight years af after this organization was started, the men outnumbered the women two to one. Over the next 17 years, ending in 2013, a dramatic change in gender balance occurred. During that time, 69 men joined as compared to 255 women. <laughs> Since 2013, men and women are joining in more equal numbers. But today, HASP is made up of approximately 450 women and 330 men. Because Carla Vershur, the new membership chairperson, is on vacation, Kim will now introduce our new HASP members and guests. Good morning. We have a rather large amount of guests this morning, probably because our speaker is a Holland native and her parents are and are here, so I'm guessing that's why. So if it's all right, um, instead of reading all 26 names, um, I'm just gonna ask all of our guests to stand today and we could give them a warm welcome of applause. I had a chance to meet some of you coming in, so again, just a warm welcome to you. We're glad that you can be with us today for this very interesting and exciting program. Okay, now I'm going to do new members for this month, and I would like you to just um, come forward in this front area when I call your name so we can all have a chance to see who you are. Um, Carol Ardsma has been reinstated. Linda Bassett. Jane Cronkite. Laureen Dewin, Linda Fairbanks, <laughs> Diane Glupker, also reinstated. Welcome back, Diane. <laughs> Joyce Sikora Horath. Ooh, look at women, women, women. <laughs> We're slowly taking over the world. Uh, Susan Jones, Mary Kempker, Gloria Sherman, Ellie Vance. 
Apparently she does have a husband, Peter, but he can't be here today, so. <laughs> Our token male is absent today. Um, gosh, this is fun. Um, Glenda Van Heis. And Linda Bice Winkleman. Wow, Larry, perfect opening today. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, you may return to your seats. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, John Cobes will now introduce his daughter, Shannon, today's speaker. John? Hello and good morning, HAST members, especially you males out there. <laughs> All four of you. <laughs> I have the distinct honor and privilege to do something every parent dreams about, and that's to introduce one of their kids, in this case my daughter Shannon, to an esteemed body like this. Uh, I know her resume by heart because a copy of it is located right here in my heart. As you know, Shannon was born and raised here in Holland, went to West Ottawa High School and graduated from there and then went on and got a bachelor's degree in geology at Michigan Tech University. After leaving Michigan Tech, she pursued her academic career and received a PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo, followed by a one-year fellowship doing research for the University of Mexico in Mexico City. Then returning to Buffalo briefly before accepting a position on the faculty at Idaho State University. Uh, Shannon had a big spring, by the way. This spring, in the span of about two or three weeks, she was awarded tenure, promoted to associate professor, and then named the director of the honors program for the entire university. Yay. <laughs> Did I mention she's my daughter? Shannon is a teacher, lecturer, administrator, and a, and a, a geoscientist, a collaborative scientist, and she works closely with NASA on three projects, which you can see up there. NASA works very much like the military. They work in acronyms. So I could tell you what those mean, but I would get it wrong. I will allow Shannon to do that. Uh, many of, of you have known her growing up, some of you even bought Girl Scout cookies from her. <laughs> and she has at least two former grade school teachers here today. Anyway, you don't want to hear me, you want to hear her. So please welcome my daughter, Dr. Shannon Cobes Nemotniak, otherwise known by me as Shannon. I'm a walker. <laughs> so good morning and thank you so much for having me. It is, it is a real pleasure and a joy to get to actually come back to Holland and talk about what I've been doing because uh, I think it's really cool stuff. And you guys can help me as ambassadors to get more kids involved in this because they don't realize just how cool science is. We tell them it's cool and then we don't actually let them do the cool stuff. Um, so we're, we're working on fixing that, but I want to tell you a little bit about my life as a faux astronaut for NASA and how we're doing work with volcanoes here on Earth to be able to prepare us to explore the solar system as a whole. 
Now, one of the questions I get a lot of times is, well, you know, volcanoes, cool? Like volcanoes themselves are cool, but why are we investing this time into it? Well, it turns out that volcanoes and impact craters are the two processes that shape the planets in our solar system. Plate tectonics, the whole moving around and stuff, that really only happens on Earth. It's the only place we found it. But volcanoes and impact craters, they're everywhere. Does anybody know what the most volcanically active planet or body in our solar system is? I'm hearing some, some, you know, some guesses. I'm hearing some Mercury. I'm hearing some Sun. I think I might have heard some Io out there. That one's got those big eruptions that Voyager saw when it went by. It's actually Earth. It is Earth. So I actually, I, I like to look this up before giving presentations so I know what the current stats are. As of about midnight last night, we had 37 active volcanic eruptions going on on Earth. We had 51 that either were minor eruptions or uh, right on the cusp of erupting. And we had another 69 that were restless. They were showing signs that they actually could get there. So we're in a very, very volcanically active planet, which means we're in a great location to be able to study this, both for our own sort of safety, you know, and also to be able to understand what's going on in the solar system. Now, we've got different kinds of volcanic eruptions out here. So a couple of ones that have been in the news lately, very big deals, the Guatemala eruption, El Fuego, and uh, the Kilauea eruption that's ongoing. Now, they have very different outcomes. We have over 100 confirmed dead at Fuego. It was an eruption that lasted for basically a day, but we have over 100 confirmed dead. And we've got um, another, say, three to 600 that are missing presumed dead. By comparison, Kilauea broke a man's leg. I mean, it's caused a huge amount of damage. We've got lots of homes, entire neighborhoods are gone. But it's a very different outcome for the hazards. And it's because they're made of different things. So they're going to erupt differently. It depends on the, the chemistry of the lava and how much water is in it, how explosive it's going to be. And fortunately for me, uh, for some of the stuff I'm doing, those ones like Kilauea, and we also have a bunch of them in Idaho as well, are this kind that is almost an exact match for what we get on Mars and the Moon. It's the same composition magma. And so we're able to actually use those as these really great analogs to understand what's going on, whereas we focus more of our work with things like El Fuego in Guatemala on sort of safety and, and hazard prevention and mitigation aspects. But just to get, convince you that things look the same, this is a picture of Idaho. This is Kings Bowl Lava Field. Uh, it's just a few miles from where I live. And it looks a lot like Siena Fosse on Mars. Down to, if we actually start labeling things, we've got extension cracks from when the magma is rising up. We've got explosion pits across the top surface. We've got lava that's expanded out from either side. We can actually use the one to help us understand what's going on at the other. This is called inferno chasm. You may have seen pictures of something like this on the moon. On the moon, we call them rills. Again, the same thing, just they get a lot bigger on the moon. Basically, everything's bigger on the moon and Mars. But other than that, they look the same. They're the same sorts of things. And so we can use them to understand the processes and help us actually guide what we want to do. Earth becomes this really accessible, experimental testing place to work out our ideas for Mars, for the moon, to help us answer the big questions, are we alone in the solar system? You know, what sort of things are we looking for? We're not looking for little green men, but we're definitely looking for microbes. You know, these little critters uh, living inside the rock. So our field areas, I'm going to talk mostly about the basalt project. Basalt, we're very proud of this. It's both the name of the rock type we study and an acronym. Uh, biologic analog science associated with lava terrains. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it is a sister project to one named Finesse, which we were already proud of before, but now it pales in comparison. It's field investigations to enable solar system science and exploration. <laughs> yeah. Nothing exists in NASA without a cool acronym. You might as well just not even bother applying. Um, but our field areas for basalt are craters of the moon, lava fields in Idaho, and the greater Kilauea area in Hawaii. And it's because they're both really, really good locations where the composition is just like what we expect to see 
on these other planetary bodies, and they can help us understand what's going on. And those other planets, say Mars, which is what's up there right now, sort of a map of Mars, we don't have that plate tectonics that's recycling the crust. We're not destroying crust, making new crust. It's actually preserving it for much longer. So we can actually see the volcanoes and see the impact craters much more clearly and start to understand things that were going on as processes, in some cases, billions of years ago to sort of put together this long-term history. Now, most of the work that NASA does with sort of practicing going to another planet, all that training that they do, involves imaginary science. You know, you go out in a rover. This is actually a photo from the uh, Desert Rats Project, uh, where rats is not actually derogatory. Uh, it stands for Research and Technology Studies. <laughs> uh, but they go out with this big experimental rover, and they've got the suits, and they go trucking around the desert in Utah, and they pick up some rocks that had little marker tags on them, and they say, yes, nobody died. They sweat like mad, but nobody died. Uh, but because they're not doing real science, they don't actually know if what they're designing is going to allow them to be able to do real science when they get there. So the vision behind our projects is to marry the science and the actual exploration, the training for the trip from a very early stage so we don't spend all of our time training to do nothing. We spend our time training to do the most effective thing that we actually can do. So we have two questions that guide our work. The first one is, where do the microbes like to live in the lava? You know, if I only get to pick up, say, 10 pounds of rock, because I've got weight limits and what I can bring back, I better pick up the right 10 pounds. So I want to know what I'm specifically looking for. What's the best outcome that I can get? What should I be searching for? And the other one is, how do we make real science work over there? Is, you know, the Apollo missions, we sent up astronauts that you know, went up and they walked on the moon and they brought us some rocks back. We sent one geologist. Almost all the people that went up with Apollo were test pilots. And the big thing from that, which I mean is still a huge deal, is that they came back alive, right? That's huge. When we actually are talking about returning to the moon and going on to Mars, we're talking about not just doing it to show that we could, but to do it and actually bring back much more science that we can. The best rock that ever came off of the moon was brought back by that one geologist, and he had to fake an emergency to get it. Because <laughs> you can't break the rules, right? You're up there, everything's scripted, so we need to build a better script. He had to pretend that his seatbelt was broken because that counts as an emergency. So they had to stop the rover, and there was no video on them. So Jack Schmidt's faking this emergency with his seatbelt, so that, that way he can pick up this rock, and his partner up there is going along with it because they've got an audio feed on them, and they're giving this voice performance of the decade. Oh yes, my seatbelt appears to not be working. <laughs> well here, Jack, let me stop and help you. Also, they could pick up this rock that is now affectionately known in the scientific community as seat belt rock. <laughs> that turns out to be the rock that answered the most questions about the formation of the moon. And it's because we had somebody up there who had some, some basis in the science, some training that could actually identify that. So what we want to do is both bring in scientists to go up there, but we, can't, we know we can't load the deck, right? We still need to have a pilot. They, they keep insisting that we need to have a doctor who can actually keep them alive. You know, an engineer to fix the ship. Well, when you're only talking about having four to six births, now you've already run out of all of your space. So we might only get one scientist on a trip. So we also want to know how can we have the brains on Earth be helping direct what's happening with the brains on Mars? To not treat them like robotic assets, but to let them be researchers and scientists and to do all of this stuff while still contributing back, but not just in isolation. Now, I think it's hard because it turns out Mars is far away. Yeah. So when we, when we, during the Apollo missions, if we were giving audio commands to the astronauts on the moon, it's about a one second delay. You get that on a bad cell phone, right? It's irritating, but it's not a problem. One-way communication to Mars takes anywhere from 4 to 22 minutes. So if I ask a question in mission control, or I give a direction, 
It'll take anywhere from four to 22 minutes, depending on their relative positions in orbit, for that message to actually get there. And then they still need to answer me. So I could be looking at a 44 minute round trip time to answer a question. Now, for the people on Earth, you tell them to just be patient, they've got a chair. But if you're in a spacesuit on another planet, you might not have 44 minutes to stand around and wait. So we need to come up with a smarter way to do it. So that was one of our tasks that we took on, is how do you actually get this to work with these problems, with these time delays? You only have oxygen for an expected four-hour EVA. That's an extravehicular activity. It's anywhere time you put on the suit. If you've got four hours, maybe like a one-hour buffer time before you actually get into your, emergent, your, your backup air, you know, how do you actually make it work when it might take almost an hour to get an answer to a question? Now, on the rock side, it turns out, so basalt on its own, is sort of a dark gray or black color. It's got a lot of iron, a lot of magnesium, very little silica by comparison to some of the other rocks. Um, but all that iron, that magnesium, when it reacts with water, we actually go from being that dark gray color to that bright orange red color. It's actually rusting at the molecular level in the rock. And as the rock is going through these processes, it's actually making elements more available to the microbes. These microbes actually eat the rock. They're actually in there, they're called endolithic microbes, and they, we have them on Earth, and they just sort of sit in the rock, and they just sort of chew their way through. And we can actually see their traces, their tracks, when we look at the thin, thin slices of the rock under very high-powered microscopes, we can actually see where they burrowed into the rock. So one of our questions is, what sort of water-rock interactions are enabling this? What sort of alteration of the rock does this? Because we already know Mars is the red planet, right? It's red because it's got rust. Where on that rust do we want to be looking for? Not all rocks are created equal, so let's actually figure out where to target. Now, doing work like this requires a large team. This is us, sort of the core members of the team at our first deployment in Idaho in 2016. We're standing in front of the Mobile Mission Control Center. It was actually driven up for us from Kennedy Space Center to Arco, Idaho, population 900. <laughs> we took over the whole town uh, because while this is our core group, when we actually get a, you start counting all of us that cycle through one of these deployments, uh, we can easily be 90 people. And we represent multiple branches of science. We've got microbiology, geochemistry, volcanology, uh, remote sensing, the people who specialize in the satellites. Uh, we've got software engineers and computer scientists that are actually writing the code for the software that we're using to manage all of this. We're actually using real NASA programs to do this. These are actual NASA researchers out there. We have people that are from the teams that actually design spacesuits. We have Steve Squires, who's the guy that drives around um, Spirit and Opportunity on the surface of Mars, the rovers. Those are his babies. But if you ask him, he'll just say he dabbles in robots. <laughs> and when he comes and he plays with us, you know what he does? He carries heavy objects. Being one of the great things about being a team like this is that everybody is all in. They want to participate, and they're passionate about it, but there's no ego on the line. And so we can get everybody working together across these different boundaries uh, to make this happen. Now, we actually do this as a full simulation of a trip to Mars. So up in this sort of pink background area, and uh, forgive me, the screens are a bit smaller than I was hoping. I didn't know how big they were going to be, so this, the picture's a little small. But in the pink background area, that's color-coded to indicate Mars. You know, red planet, pink. Blue planet, Earth, that's Earth. Um, so here in the field, we've got two people that are being the astronauts during any one EVA. They're sort of, you know, out of vehicle walkabout. They are being supported by a crew of people that are playing the role of robot. You know, in a real situation, they would have been carried out there in one of those rovers like I showed you that picture of before. Turns out those are really hard to ship, so we didn't bother. Instead, we just grabbed a couple of students and said, hey, you look strong. <laughs> How would you like to spend three weeks in Hawaii with NASA? <laughs> just carry this heavy backpack. It'll be fine. Uh, so their job is to play the robot. When they get out there, they're not even really allowed to speak, so they spend a lot of time carrying heavy objects and eating lunch. Um, and then we've got this person sort of off, off to the side up there uh, sort of a little bit in isolation, sort of the top of the edge there. 
they're playing the, the role of the communication relay because we're crawling through some, some pretty broken terrain, we're going through some um, ravines, we've got cliffs, we've got all of this, but we need to actually maintain line of sight contact uh, with all of our relay points because we actually have to bring in all of our own internet, we have to bring in all of our own signal. Uh, we can't even trust that there's going to be a cell phone signal in the places that we go. We have to bring it all in with us, which means we need to be able to have that relay. Now, all of that is being transmitted live to a room that has two people in it, and they're called the IV team, or the intravehicular team. And they're the astronauts that are on Mars, but they're in the Mars habitat. They don't have to wear the suits. They can sit at a console. They can eat their lunch. But they're giving live time guidance. So they're actually seeing chest cam video that's coming back from the astronauts. They have an open mic access to them. They can just chat with them if they want. Um, they're getting this, any photos that they take in the field are being brought straight back to them. And they can just talk their way through it. They can be right there with them. So we had in our first deployment, uh, one of our astronauts panicked that he couldn't tell if something was a, a white mineral growing on a rock or if it was lichen. It was a hot day. He was tired, and he had no idea anymore, and he knew that he was not allowed to collect lichen, but if it was a new mineral, he needed to collect it, and he panicked. Uh, so the person that was in the IV station, that astronaut, they've been sitting in air conditioning. You know, they've got the extra brain capacity that they can say, oh, don't worry about it, just take your glove off, flick it with your thumbnail, and tell me what it does. Does it break off? Can you scrape it off? All right, there we go. Um, and so having that brain power that you can take away from being in this very uncomfortable situation to somebody else who can live support you is critical. The IV person is also the one who's in charge of speaking to Earth. So they're the one who's actually controlling the information flow. Because when you're talking about having a voicemail come from four to 22 minutes in the past, you really didn't want to hear it right then. You're actually working on something else, so having somebody just have this voice blast into your head you could be doing anything right then. It really might be a bad time. So we use text messaging that goes to these astronauts in the IV station, and then they forward that along as appropriate. Now, Earth is this bigger sort of blue room in the bottom where we've got all these people. We're either in the mobile mission control room uh, when we're in Idaho, or we actually rent out Kilauea military camp uh, conference rooms when we're in Hawaii. And we have uh, a flight director, we have a SCICOM, science communicator, a science lead, we've got leads for all of our different kinds of science. Uh, we have an ethnographer, we've got stenographers, we've got an entire team of people whose job it is to figure out what is going on. And they're getting, the, depending on how we're running it, they might get video, they definitely get the audio, but, and they're definitely gonna get still photos that the astronauts are taking in the field. We don't even know if we actually need to have video. Right? And if we want to have video coming from Mars during one of these events, we're going to have to pick, that's going to increase the budget. So we need to know if we need that budget. Can we do this science without video? So they're back there, semi-blind, living in the past, watching this stuff come in, and they've got to actually make informed decisions, because this is where we put all of our brain power. The smartest scientists on Earth are not the ones that we're going to have standing on Mars. I mean, astronauts are good, don't get me wrong. But our goal is to train them up to being decent monkey technicians. <laughs> you know, we want them to be capable of independent thought and to still take an order. You know, it's not up to them to have to represent all of science for all of the planet. That's why we have all these people sitting in a specialist team on Earth and mission control. So we've got all of this going on with communication uh, being relayed back and forth. Now, this is what it looks like in the field. This is the one day out of three deployments that it was cold. Normally, uh, it was somewhere around 95 degrees. We learned the hard way that those backpacks turn off when they hit 165. Um, and they're heavy. They're, they're wildly heavy, so we actually keep the knee pads on at all times. Once you're in this backpack, you cannot take it off. Uh, since our minimum actual active time is four hours, and it doesn't count the walk in and the walk out, that meant we normally wore one of these packs anywhere from six to nine hours at a time. If you've ever had to figure out how to go to the bathroom <laughs> while wearing a 60-pound pack that's 160 degrees and has a camera videoing everything, <laughs> we got good. 
Oh yeah, we, we, we are a talented team. We also got really good at being able to, sometimes when you're with your partner, and, and even if the, the video is not transmitting all the way back, the audio is, and so occasionally we had accidental blockouts. <laughs> yeah. Or my partner and I, so Steve my, is my astronaut partner, uh, and he's an engineer with NASA, and when we were just wanting to just be salty, just be irritated, and you just didn't need to transmit that to anybody else, we got really good at just turning away so you couldn't see each other's face in the cameras and just mouthing it to each other. <laughs> can, can you believe this? They want us to take a break, or we just want to finish. So those backpacks, uh, after our first deployment, we actually got custom backpacks so it would fit a little bit better. And they're color-coded, so that way anybody who's watching can tell whether you are a scientist or an engineer, because all of our astronaut teams are a partnership of a scientist and an engineer. And then we've got our spare person, who's that relay, who has to run around and crawl through things. Um, you know, we, we had one day where we couldn't figure out, we just, we'd gone through this really cool era and this lava flow with a lava fall cascade on the side of, of Mauna Ulu over by Kilauea, this was gorgeous, and there was no comms. We couldn't tell anyone on Earth about it, and we're trying to figure out what just happened. And we look back, and it's because our poor comms relay guy is literally belly crawling to get underneath the lava fall, because he was too tall to actually walk through it. And so he's belly crawling on the rock in this 65-pound pack. Uh, and we just told him he needed to be faster. <laughs> we love him to pieces. So you can actually see the three of us uh, sort of set up uh, one of our days. So the two of us is our astronaut pair in the foreground. And then you can sort of see lurking in the background, always lurking, is our comm relay. We like to think of him as being kind of like Smeagol from Lord of the Rings or Gollum. You know, you're on the mission to destroy the one ring and there's just like a weird little person following you. Um, so we would work together to be able to get through all of the tasks. We'd have, to, we'd have to find locations that looked like they might be good candidates, rocks that might be interesting. And so we'd put down these label cards, you know, Alpha Alpha, Alpha Bravo, Bravo Charlie, to be able to tag these in physical space and with a name that that way the people on Earth could argue about it. You know, we'd take photos and we'd have scale bars. And the first thing we do is we go out and we take these photos so that we have a whole bunch of photos and they can say, wow, that's all a gray rock. <laughs> or stop everything, Bravo Charlie, definitely, we want more info about Bravo Charlie. And their goal on Earth was to be able to take that long list that we gave them and narrow it down to what the priorities were. Because we only have so much time. We have to keep cycling through the, these activities. Now you know it, I'm kind of doing this weird thing with my hand. It's because I've got to put my shadow on top of the note card. It was reflective. And if I didn't do that, you couldn't see what was actually on it. So the people who are actually receiving this photo, because this is one of the photos that transmitted through the, the data management system back to Earth, they had no idea what that was. So it sometimes meant that we had to get really creative with our field yoga to be able to get the shadow in the right place while wearing the backpack and not fall off the rock. Now, once we got feedback from Earth about which of the rocks they liked best just from photos, then we'd come back and we could take additional measurements. So in this case, we're using a field spectrometer. It actually looks kind of like a good old-fashioned phaser gun from Star Trek. You give us something that looks like a laser gun and we're just happy. It, oh, it's, it's, you know, I'd like to pretend we're grown up enough that that wasn't a major motivating factor, but we all wanted to be the one using the zap zap gun. Uh, but we zap the rock, and it actually reads spectral information about the visible and near infrared uh, reflectance uh, on the minerals, and we can use that to figure out which minerals are in there. And then we have to send it back. We have, you know, a picture of the rock, a little corner of it in there, the card, so you don't get confused which one it goes to, and then a picture of the screen, which was awful. Because you're trying to take a picture of a screen while somebody is holding it, and you got to get the light just right. So it was, it was a real art form. Uh, we later got some instruments that could actually transmit directly through our computer system. But some of the instruments aren't capable of that. So that's on our wish list. We're working on designing the ultimate tricorder. Yeah, Star Trek reference. Uh, we also go out and we can measure things like the temperature. So we have a thermal camera that will transmit photos back. So this is side by side of the temperature map overlain with the actual photo off to the side. So you can see, okay, if I'm looking for a specific temperature, what am I looking for? Sometimes we wanted a rock that was going to be 80 degrees Celsius. As a reminder, 100 degrees Celsius is boiling water. 
So we wanted very hot rocks in some cases, or we needed very cold rocks in some cases. And we could use this to be able to ensure that we're getting what we think we're actually getting. All of that's being transmitted through our backpacks, these giant monsters backpacks that the, the guy who designed it, who was the guy who was belly crawling and is the guy who lurks behind us. He's also the engineer from NASA. He works at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, he's the one who gets to build the entire thing. Uh, he's wonderful. But he keeps insisting that they're only 35 pounds and no one has ever managed to believe him yet. <laughs> um, but they are complex engineering. He had to do redesigns on them. These are effectively computers. They don't even have space for your lunch. It's a heavy computer system that is designed to be able to take all that video, all of that audio, all those still photos, and be able to transmit it through our network to make it back to Earth. And it's entirely about communications and a tiny little bit of water capacity. So that way you don't get dehydrated while you're working out there. Uh, so you can actually see inside of one of them right there, we're doing field surgery, you know, pulling it out, checking the fans, uh, we required actually building snorkels onto them, make sure you get airflow going, we had ice packs, to be able to ensure that they worked the way we wanted them to work. Because it turns out temperature conditions in an Idaho summer are not the same as on Mars. So that, that added some challenges for us. Now all that information that you're collecting is being transmitted through your backpack, and here's a picture of the IV station who's receiving it. So they're sitting in this, this small room, they've got screens everywhere. The two of them on the left are the intravehicular astronauts. So when they, we actually rotate jobs. So on days that I was in the field, they were my IV and vice versa. Uh, so I would sit in the IV chair. And then we have uh, another person, and then a third person is a stenographer, trying to wildly take notes so that way we don't miss anything. Now one of the things I think is really cool about our project is that that stenographer, it's in that picture there, her name is Chanel Vidal. She was 15 years old, she was a high school student. She was interested in science. Uh, she is now, she just finished her freshman year at the wrong ISU. She went to <laughs> Iowa State. Um, but she is from Iowa, so it makes sense, where she had a full ride and is a major in geology. Um, you know, and so we have a chance for these things to be able to provide mentorship. We have teachers from area high schools that come out to get authentic science experiences. And so keeping this involved and like reaching out to our community as we're doing these cool things and getting them real jobs. But we spent a lot of time hiking around trying to find rocks, carrying our laser guns, zapping them, getting feedback back from Earth. Hey, I like this one. I don't like that one. After they've seen those laser gun results, that's where they actually tell us which ones they want us to collect. And now we have to collect them in sterile conditions. Now, I'm a geologist. In my world, when you collect a rock, you bend over and you pick it up. It's easy. If any, have any of you guys ever watched The Big Bang Theory? Yeah. That's some yeses. So you know that there are lots of joking terms for geologists. Um, you know, I, I personally love that they've declared us to be the Kardashians of science. <laughs> uh, but one of the ones that's more commonly used as well is that we're rock lickers, and it's because we lick the rocks. <laughs> It's not a bad term, it's an honest term. So there are certain rocks you can only tell apart from each other if you lick them. You know, I don't want to bring it back to the lab to do it the hard way. Well, it turns out when you're looking for microbes, you're not allowed to lick the rocks. <laughs> so you have no idea how hard this is on me. Um, not only am I not allowed to lick the rocks, we have to actually do this using sterile gloves. Um, our rock hammers have to be flame sterilized with alcohol. They are packed in sterile bags. If I accidentally brush my sledgehammer, because these are sledges we have to use to be able to break this rock, against my pant leg, it is now considered a dead hammer. I cannot use it, it's contaminated. Uh, if I touch it with any part of me. So we have to then, we find our rock. One person, you know, gloves up is the person allowed to touch the rock. The other person has one sterile hand and one sledgehammer hand if they can do that, or they just have two dirty hands and they can't touch any of the rocks but the sledgehammers themselves are sterile. And you beat on the rock until you can get them the right sizes. Because when we're doing this, we, it's not just one rock. I want, I want one of those rocks for my geology lab. I need to actually process this. My microbiology team, they're in Scotland. We're not sharing a rock. <laughs> my organic geochemistry team, they're in Canada. 
again, not sharing a rock. And we need different sizes. So we have to get all of these rocks in replicate. We call it our fruit basket sampling method because we need to have one that's the size of an orange, three that are the size of kiwis, two that are the size of grapefruit, and one that might be a small melon. Yeah. And, and so we have to collect all of these. You're allowed to touch it with two fingers in the gloves, get it into the sterile bag. Uh, and it's, it's challenging. And the entire time, we've got people watching you that if you brush it against your sleeve, if you do anything like that, you've got to abandon the rock. You can't use it. Now, I, I can still use it for my work as a geologist, or we can use it as the archive sample that we keep as an emergency backup. But I can't send that to either my microbiology or my, my organic geochemistry teams. So we have to be very careful about how we do this. There's a lot of precision work. We feel like we're scrubbing and we pretend that we're doctors. We're standing there and you're sweating so you also can't let your arms hang down. So you're just standing here, gloved up, <laughs> waiting for surgery, in our case means picking up a rock. <laughs> so you can bend over and pick up that rock. Now we also are, are very serious people. And we once in a while do get into laser gun wars. I would like to point out that neither of these is a dangerous laser. Uh, we actually do have some that we really cannot shoot at each other. Uh, we actually have to go through training for, we have to wear dosimeters to be able to use. Uh, we have one that actually shoots a small laser that will vaporize the surface material into a plasma and reads that, which we just think is fantastic. Um, but we, we are, we are, it turns out, grown up enough to not shoot those at each other. <laughs> so these are just the ones that use passive, passive light. One of the other things that we end up using that turns out to be really, really helpful are drones. So we have research drones that will fly over to be able to actually create detailed maps of the area we're going in, and if necessary, fly in while we're working to be able to provide overhead support. We've used them at times to be able to deliver gear when something broke in the field. We've used them to be able to provide context. So in this image, this is actually from the Idaho deployment. And you can actually see the team working in the field there as the drone is flying over top of them, trying to get a sense for the space. Because on a lava flow, everything can look flat. You look at a cross, and it can be these, these waves that are a full story tall in the lava. But when you look at a cross, it's all just lava. You can't see it anymore because your angle is too close to it. So sometimes this provides us a way to be able to see what's really going on. Uh, so we, we, we definitely think of ourselves as, you know, on our mission to Mount Doom to destroy the One Ring. We've got, we have the volcano, and now we have our giant eagles that are coming in to save us, um, delivering stuff as necessary. So th this was photoshopped by one of my teammates in the field uh, after we ended up using the drone to be able to do an emergency delivery of a broken um, cable on somebody's headset. We'd actually lost one of the astronauts, their audio. We couldn't hear them at all, which is a problem because you need to hear what they're saying. And so we flew it out there, and it worked. And there was a guy standing there on this top of this ledge, and he collects it as it comes down. And it was this glorious thing. And that immediately started the request for ice cream delivery, <laughs> which wasn't going to happen. Uh, so when we get these rocks back, one of the things that we actually do is we, we cut them down until they look like uh, dominoes. And then we glue them to a glass slide, just like you maybe use in biology class. And we grind them down so they're thinner than a sheet of paper. If you hold it up, you can just see right through it. It's, it's clear. We put it in a special, special kind of microscope uh, that puts the light through. And we can actually massage the orientations of the light so we can actually see all of the different microcrystals that exist in the lava. Lava tends to have such tiny crystals that it's hard to really see anything in it. So we need to actually get it back to look at this and see, OK, what are the minerals I actually have? They're too small to see. What do I have? And what's really cool about this, and I wish that I was able to do this as a video, but I only have a still shot, is as you rotate the stage on the microscope, the colors change. Because the light is coming through, and it's refracting. And you'll actually go across the whole spectrum of rainbow. It's kind of like having a kaleidoscope that you get to play with for work. Uh, as we get to figure out what those are. And so we do that. We, we powder the minerals. We grind them up into a fine powder. And we use an x-ray to understand exactly which major element oxides are in there and which uh, minor elements are in there. And so we can actually look at how that's changed from, say, the base part of the rock to after it's been altered. We had that water interaction. And we're taking that and we're correlating that to the results that we're getting from our biology team. And our biologists are actually doing DNA extractions. They're figuring out exactly which species are there. Now, this is one of those sort of wheel of life things. I couldn't tell you the details on it. 
which is convenient because I made the font too small to read. <laughs> so don't ask too many questions. But what this one specifically is for is for one of our rocks in Idaho. And what it really is telling us is that most of the rocks that were in that, most of the microbes in that particular area, even the ones that were living 20, 30 centimeters, even further inside of the rock, they actually got blown in. They were brought in by wind that was bringing it along, and they filtered down into these cracks. And now we're, Idaho is a high desert. We don't get a whole lot of water, but there was just enough water that every so often, it'll percolate down in, and it'll carry these microbes deeper and deeper. And they don't require a whole lot to live on, and they were able to get enough of it from just other stuff that was being carried down in with them. Which was a bummer, because that wasn't the kind of microbe we wanted. <laughs> but, it was the kind of microbe that's more common. It also told us that we needed to reevaluate how we can do some of that sampling. Because while on Earth, our concern is that we've got too many microbes or that surface dweller style that are eating the stuff that's being blown around in the wind, on Mars, the concern is the radiation. There are high doses of radiation to the surface of that planet, so we need to be talking about getting inside the rock deeper. We need to get to those protected zones where you can actually maintain that water where you can maintain moisture, where you can actually minimize the radiation load that's being put onto these microbes, we're going to have a better shot of actually finding the stuff that's alive. We've actually had much better success working with fumarole, so it's an area where we've got active hot water coming out of the ground uh, in Hawaii. But we didn't have any of those in Idaho. Idaho, uh, well, you're all like, Idaho, what's in Idaho? You know, Idaho is very volcanically active, thank you very much. We have some amazing hot springs. Um, and we actually have some volcanoes that are likely to erupt in the next 100 years. You know, there, there's no motion on them right now, but based off of the recurrence interval, it's definitely not done. We've, right outside my, home, my town I'm living in now, uh, we have more than a mile thick of lava flows. It's been, it's been going on for quite a while, and it's definitely not done. So. You know, we, we have these, these different environments, and we can use them to sort of get this grasp on, okay, well, this is, this is dead. And it's okay if what we also find on Mars is dead, but what we want to then do is, can I actually find the trace lipids, because the lipids will last after the microbe is long gone, can we preserve those? Can I actually find this chemical fossil, effectively, of the microbe that used to be there? And we're actually working on analyzing that part right now. The woman who's doing that just had a baby. So she's been on maternity leave for a little bit, so that works a little bit behind. Um, but we spend a lot of our time, the, the, what we do, our field work, that's probably 10% of the job. It's an incredible 10%. I mean, I get to tell students when I talk at elementary schools that I actually got paid to be a fake astronaut for NASA. I mean, that's pretty high up there. It's professional grade floor is lava type stuff. Um, you know, in the upper left picture there, my, my partner astronaut, uh, this last deployment, was actually a man named uh, Dr. Steve, Dr. Stan Love. Uh, and he's actually a real astronaut. So the astronaut program isn't interested enough in what we're doing that they're actually sending us real astronauts to start doing this so that that way they can give us a reality check and we can actually help them already start the process of training for what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, and sometimes, in our case, that also means huddling in the lava flow while you wait for the storm to pass. Um, but the question always is, what's next? Well, our next thing that we're starting up is called Subsea. It's Systematic Underwater Biogeochemical Science and Exploration Analog. <laughs> right? Uh, and so this August, we're actually heading to Loihi off the coast of Hawaii with submarines. So we're going with uh, the Nautilus. That's the research vessel that's pictured up there. And we're going to be using unmanned submarines to be able to look at the water rock interactions and the microbial communities associated with the seamounts down there uh, as an analog for Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons. It's considered one of the hot locations for life in the solar system right now. And we're using a place on Earth that actually has the same, same temperature and pressure conditions as what we think the seafloor of Enceladus is to be able to understand what might be there. You know, what's, the, what's the chemistry going on? What are the reactions that are happening? So it has been a pleasure to chat with you a little bit about what I'm doing with using the Earth to explore the solar system, both from a science side and the exploration side, getting to be fake astronauts. Uh, you know, we're really passionate about this being the, the way of the future. We need to be able to know what to do before we go out and try and do it for real. 
And so doing this on Earth, using Earth as this test bed is an incredible opportunity for us to be able to work out everything from the software to the hardware to how you talk across these messages. So I've got a research paper coming out right now that is all about text messaging Mars. I, I feel very millennial saying that. Uh, but these are all parts of what we need to do to be able to make this work as we go forward and we expand our search uh, into the solar system. So thank you very much. We do have a few minutes for some questions, um, so if you just raise your hand, either Joyce or I will run you down and uh, give you an opportunity to ask Shannon. <laughs> Donna. <laughs> Miss Sh Shannon, do you have ambition to be not a fake astronaut, but to get to go? <laughs> You know, if they, when they reopen applications, I will definitely submit. Most of my team have actually been finalists or semi-finalists, and one of the girls from our team was selected in the last class. Yeah, uh, so she actually was our person who, one of our people who carried heavy objects. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you saw the previous announcement when they, they announced the last asteroid class, the tiny little blonde girl, um, uh, Zena Cardman, she's actually a member of our team. But they only, they only do those uh, applications every so many years. So we'll see. Dad is absolutely opposed. <laughs> for the record. For the record. This, this is the parent who doesn't want his child to be an astronaut. Thank you. This is really fascinating stuff. But um, my husband, being the absent one man, <laughs> I put on a plane this morning at, uh, well, I left him at about uh, 5.30, I think it was, and he's on his way to Idaho, and he and a couple of our college friends are going to, who are still alive, are going to actually uh, be backpacking in the Saw Ridge Mountains. So I was doing some research. I know nothing about Idaho except potatoes, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I was amazed at what goes on out there. I was getting into the lava caves and things that, that are around, the basalt and so forth, the different kinds, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they also mentioned, I mean, this is a hotbed of activity out there, that it was actually one of the early nuclear power sites and that there was a, um, a tragedy that occurred with that. And I wondered, I, you're probably not associated at all with that, or, or is that kind of a corner of your world, too? Thank you. Yeah, so that's Idaho National Lab. Uh, we're one of the lesser known national labs in the United States, but just like Los Alamos or, or, or Oak Ridge, um, Idaho National Lab is actually about 40 minutes from where I live. So other than ISU, it's the other major employer in my town. Um, and that's actually the first place where they actually had nuclear power plants able to generate electricity. Uh, Arco, Idaho, where we were actually based, was the first town powered by nuclear power. So they have Adams for Peace Park. Um, so yeah, that's actually in the area. And so one of the things that we, of course, always are concerned about too is this, they're built on lava flows. Uh, because back when we first started building this, the major thing is, hey, this is a desert. So it's, it's far from flowing waters. So that minimizes the risk to people. Um, it's the middle of nowhere. That helps. Yeah. And they were looking at those sorts of things. But the, the likelihood of an eruption is actually still fairly, is fairly low, so they didn't worry about it. Because it didn't occur to them how recently things had actually erupted. Yeah, they just hadn't seen anything in historic time. The last eruption was 2,000 years ago. Uh, we have a recurrence interval of slightly under 2,000 years. Uh, no, I mean, we're in geology, the error bars are large. But, you know, that is something that we, we definitely watch for and we monitor for whether or not we have volcanic activity that could potentially threaten I Idaho National Lab. Uh, and they actually have safety mechanisms in place to be able to do complete shutdowns and be able to stash everything so that way we don't have a full meltdown. The, the meltdown that had the catastrophe was in the early days. I uh, was still sort of learning how to do stuff. And so, yeah, that's, it's clean, you know. 
Uh, we actually have colleagues who actually do the regular water testing to see if they have anything that's actually leaking out and affecting the, the water supply in the area. And so it's, they do a lot of work for being able to monitor. It's a race. Thank you for your talk. It's interesting. I, as a teacher, retired teacher, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I was curious as to how close you are to the Yellowstone uh, development down there. Does your research get affected by any of the eruptions that occur in the plateau out there? And are you anywhere close to it? Yeah, so we actually have our lava flows because of Yellowstone. Uh, so Yellowstone uh, is a hot spot, and the North American plate has been drifting over top of it. It uh, started erupting about 16 million years ago down over with a sort of Idaho, Nevada, Oregon border area. And now it's in its current position, mostly over in Wyoming. I live about halfway between Yellowstone and Salt Lake City. It's great. City on one side, absolute nowhere on the other. Um, you know, we, we had a bear break into our zoo last week. Um, it, it, it's true. It, it's true. They had to shut down the zoo because the bear broke in. Um, but so we have our lava flows on the Snake River Plain because Yellowstone came through as that hot spot and it obliterated everything that was in its path. And it, it just has these basalt lava flows that came out afterwards and it's sort of filling in that sort of trough that the larger volcano carved. Now Yellowstone uh, itself, the, the sort of big cold area as we see it now where the park is, the last major eruption was about 660,000 years ago. Uh, we, of course, have lots of geothermal activity there. We have no reason to think that it's actually done uh, erupting. But we also have continual monitoring there uh, that we have no reason to think that it's actually getting active. Uh, we, of course, have almost an annual scare where somebody decides to post something on the internet, making it sound like it's about to erupt. A couple years back, somebody actually just recorded some bison running down the road in the park and advertised this, it went viral that the bison were trying to escape prior to an eruption. And I actually ended up having to write emails to students' parents to assure them that their child wasn't about to die. Uh, it turns out, if you, if you knew the park, you also knew the bison were running towards the middle of it, and it's just because occasionally bison run. Um, <laughs> But it is something that we, we do actually keep an eye on. Uh, the, there are, is a full-time Yellowstone Volcano Observatory that watches it uh, to be able to track for any changes. It has continual earthquakes. It has continual ground motion. But all that's very normal. Um, you know, and it's the, most of them are small enough that guests in the park never even realize you know, what all is going on. Uh, but if it, when someday it goes again, uh, it will be a real big problem. Uh, but the, the timing on that, I mean, this, that could be another 100,000 years from now or so. We, have, we don't really know. In connection with that, I, I had heard we'd been down to the craters of the moon. It's kind of interesting. It looks like nothing, and then it's very interesting once you get there. But we were told that the geysers in Yellowstone have an awful lot to do with connection with craters in the moon. Is that true? Well, sort of, in that the, the heat that's driving the geysers, like Old Faithful uh, and stuff up at Yellowstone, is actually the same heat that's, that's ultimately responsible for all of the lavas that we have at Craters of the Moon and across the eastern Snake River Plain. So it's that same heat, that same magma body underneath, it's actually causing all of this stuff to be going on out there. It's giving us hot springs, it's giving us the geysers, uh, it's giving us these lava flows. Uh, the reason why the lava flows aren't actually as explosive, we don't, we don't get the geysers that we have at Yellowstone, we also don't get the big explosive eruptions that you get at Yellowstone, um, it's because uh, it's effectively already used up that, that very gas-rich, explosive uh, sort of sputtering. And so we're now in most of the Snake River Plain, including Craters of the Moon, we're in kind of that slow ooze that comes out afterwards. So you have this big explosion, and then afterwards you're going to have now release the explosive phase, and you're just going to have lava that just sort of keeps coming and pouring out. And over volcanic time, having 2,000 years between eruptions is nothing at all. So it's just like these lots of little eruptions as it's releasing that, that heat and that magma that's still trapped underneath there that's what's giving us all of that activity up at Yellowstone. It makes it such a treasure. 
One more question here, coming behind you. Um, you used the or showed the uh, helicopter drone in the in the slides. I, I'm just curious: is there a thought that those might be feasible on the actual Mars trip? There is research on it right now. So one of the problems of being able to use drones on Mars is the lack of atmosphere. Now, at various points in the past, Mars had much more of an atmosphere. It had standing water. It had a very different situation than it did now. But when it lost that uh, liquid metal outer core that we have here. It's, it, Mars is at one-tenth the size of Earth, so it cooled down, it froze over, and when that happened, it actually lost the magnetic field protection of the atmosphere, and it burned away. So now we've got very, very little atmosphere up there, which makes it incredibly difficult to get a drone to fly. It spins its, it spins its little propellers, and it, there's nothing for it to catch on. It just sort of sits there. Uh, so on the next lander that's going up, they've actually been putting a lot of effort in uh, working with very large research-grade vacuum chambers to try and create drones that will be capable of flying in very, very low atmosphere conditions, and there is one that's slated to go up on the next lander. Their entire goal for that drone is to not crash. I mean, that's the, that's the level of cutting edge that it is. It's don't crash. You know, and then if they've got past that, now they can actually start worrying about, okay, what more can we get from the science from this? Because you can put cameras on it, you can do all sorts of really cool stuff uh, with these drones, or, or UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial ve vehicles, to be able to get uh, really high resolution data, stuff that we would pr probably want to have in hand before we actually asked people to walk around in these situations. But right now, we're still working on developing the technology but it is an active area. Shannon, uh, some of us here are former teachers, neighbors, family, friends, and we're incredibly proud of who you've become and uh, delighted by your sharing today. For others of us, it's been an introduction to a world that we have no idea uh, <laughs> what it is, and uh, we marvel. Uh, but for all of us, I think we say thanks for exploring uh, this with us.